Okay, on today's episode, we have singer-songwriter from West Virginia, Miss Sierra Farrell. And man, it was a pleasure, truly a pleasure to sit down with her, to hear her story. Um, we talk about her life hopping trains, um, hitching rides, busking from Seattle down to New Orleans, and then of course her journey to Nashville. And uh, she's got a new album that, that just released, Long Time Coming. And um, it's one of those, like her voice is so unique and she's so confident in what she does. So as with any musician that we have on the show, we ask them to play a song to close it out. And uh, Sierra plays one of my favorites per my request and uh, definitely one that you guys are going to want to hear. So hope you guys enjoy the show and until next time, stay grateful. The Converse Cowboy Journey has given me an opportunity to sit down with some amazing performers that are living the Western lifestyle or it is my job to tease out their habits and routines so that you can apply and test yourself in your own life. I've learned, I've grown personally, I've been enlightened, and I've been humbled. Above all, I realize that there is no destination in this life, no goal achieved or money made that can replace the feeling of flow and the pursuit of doing what you love to do. With a growth mindset, I'm constantly asking questions and pursuing knowledge. Converse Cowboy is a platform that allows me to do just that. I'm excited and eager to share their stories with you all. I'm Mike Roberts. This is the Converse Cowboy. Brought to you by Kerry Kelly Bits and Spurs and Schaefer Outfitter. So tell me about the album, Long Time Coming. Where did the name come from? Is it because it was a long time coming? It's interesting to me, you know, the musicians that I sit down with will have songs that have been in the bank or sitting in a notebook for years, and then they finally make their way to an album. So tell me how this one came about and, and how you landed on that name. Well, this album is um, an eclectic, you know, it's an eclectic group of songs because I feel like some of them are really old or, you know, like a few years old, and that seems pretty old to me. <laughs> but... um you know, I've, there, there's actually like a couple songs that I've written just to uh, be on the record, to take up some extra space. And they're, um, they turn out to be my favorites, I think, maybe. <laughs> um, yeah, I, I uh, in doing, doing the, and I really enjoyed doing the research on you and, and getting a glimpse into your, your story. And um, you said somewhere that, that those are some of the, your, your more favorite songs, I guess, to write, the ones that take a while to actually put together. Yeah. And, and we'll get into some of that, and, and I do have ADD, so we'll probably bounce around a good bit. It's, I'm okay with that. But <laughs> I definitely want to get into the songwriting and, and, and all of that stuff. Yeah. Um, so tell me, tell me how is that? Like, because we're in uncharted waters with COVID, and you can tour, you can't tour, and you release, <laughs> you, you know, you're releasing this album, and we're, we're I, you know, last year this time, I didn't think we would still be in it, but now it seems like there's another wave coming. Yeah. So how are you navigating that, and, and how was that? that like how did that play with your psyche as you're rolling out this, these new songs that you did pour your heart into and you spent years developing uh well COVID definitely threw a stick in the tire um uh you know it at first it was amazing because I was touring a lot more and I had a bunch of stuff coming up and we weren't 100 percent sure what every, what was going on you mm -hmm. know everything was up in the air and at first I loved it because I was like, okay, I'm just gonna make charcuterie boards and uh, sit around and watch YouTube videos and <laughs> uh, Netflix shows. Right. And it's, it was awesome for a minute, but then after a few weeks, I was like, okay, I'm ready to I'm do something. It. Silver lining is I did write a whole bunch of new songs and I started playing and exploring more on other instruments. And honestly, just the other day, I started playing piano a little bit, and um, I feel like that's a way of, for writing songs for me is to pick up a new instrument or oh, something right I don't play. What all do you play? Um, I, I play guitar, I play, I used to be in this all time, uh, Lady band. Mm -hmm. Oh, I was a, it was all time lady band. I was in this all ragtime. I saw that it was lady. called ragtime <laughs> yeah. ladies. Right? Ladies on the rag. Ladies on the rag. Okay. <laughs> but, ladies uh, on the rag. <laughs> <laughs> Who came that, up with the name, or was it like a collaboration? It was definitely a collabor co collaboration. But uh, <laughs> I, I think that uh, our guitar player at the time, she was like, "This is what the name of the band's gonna be," and we all, you know, we we agreed. We we're like, "This is perfect." <laughs> 
And so I played bucket bass in that band and I did like harmonies a bunch and um Now I'm naive. What is what is a bucket bass? Well, uh it's like it's like a bass, but it's a bucket. <laughs> like the Yeah. The stuff you see in it's New like, Orleans like Yeah, it's like a big tub. You can go to like a Home Depot or or just like your local hardware store that has buckets, you a know. A 5 gallon bucket. Yeah, just like a or like the I you know, you can pick out which one you like the best. But uh, I personally like the metal tubs. Okay. That are kind of, th you know, they're pretty big. I'm not going to even throw any numbers out there. I'm terrible with math. Um, but then you just, like, get so a couple washers and a couple, you know, you screw it down the middle, put washers in between, get a wing nut, and mm -hmm. swing it on, and uh, get, like, a thing that has, like, a loop. So then you can, uh, that comes out at the top of it. And then you put, I like to personally get weed whacker string. And then you, you need to get a long pole or a stick, some, something that can hold the string above it. And I, like, I usually have it to where it's two separate pieces. And then you put it on there and then you just pull back and you hit it and it like hits different notes the further oh, you pull it back, yeah. So you gotta make it, you can't go to the music store. Well, you, got, you gotta make it or you gotta find someone who makes them. Right on. Which, you know, I might look into that. There you go. Start selling Big business, them online. Big business man. <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> um, okay, so let, let's go back a little bit. So grew up in West Virginia, then you moved to Nashville around 2014. S did you sign with Rounder Records at that time? Or was that um, a few years later? I didn't sign with Rounder Records until 2019. 2019, okay. Mm -hmm. So you spent some time in Nashville before you signed with anybody. Yeah, and like, you know, I was still pretty transient because I didn't really legitimately move here until I'm gonna say about five-ish years now. Okay. Four or five-ish years. I was, you know, I was going to Seattle a bunch because my partner at the time lived there and plus I just love street performing there. It was pretty gentle compared to a lot of the other places. I definitely want to dig in, into the busking thing. Yeah. But to go back even further, so did you come from a musical family? Did, parents play anybody in your family play like how did you get introduced to music well you know my mom she always loved singing she sang all the time and I thought she had a pretty voice but she begged to differ you know she was like I don't like singing and she's you know she's with her Virginia Slim Super Slims <laughs> and they look like a little candy box and she was always smoking those and she's like I smoke too many cigarettes sissy <laughs> <laughs> And um, yeah, um, I so I guess you know maybe it kind of runs maybe in the blood like where music is in there. But ever since I could talk, you know, my mom was telling me I've always just been singing and making noises and yeah, just you know she thought there was something wrong with me. Probably is, but you know, <laughs> <laughs> but you know, I just uh, I found out recently that on my dad's side of the family that they're really in um, to bluegrass music, like a lot of the, a lot of the men on, on his side. Right and, on. and I don't really know any of them, so I never really got to get that connection. I got you, that. I got you. So what time, or, or at what time did you start playing? How old were you? Well, you know, I started to dabble a little bit with, a, uh, with um, an acoustic guitar that was just laying around, and I never really took it seriously, but I, I did take a guitar class in high school, and, um, I definitely feel like that helped me a lot. So you picked up the guitar at what age? Probably around 12. Really? But then I set it back down. Okay. You know, like it wasn't like something like, I'm like, this is what I want to do forever. Mm -hmm. And um, and to be honest, my work ethic is not very superior. And so, then or now? <laughs> forever. <laughs> 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 but, um, but yeah, so then I, I, I as I, continued to get older I went to high school and I'm like oh I'm gonna take this guitar class and then you know each little little bit of sort of musical experience that you get along the way it kind of just helps you no matter what like even if you're right. not doing it every day I feel like if you're somewhat involved just like you know I was like involved in chorus probably throughout all my school years you know yeah elementary middle high were any of your friends doing that? Were they in bands? Were they playing music? Yeah, I played. I, mean, I was actually in band. I played clarinet, but I didn't know that New Orleans style music existed because mm -hmm. I grew up in West Virginia. And not saying that people from West Virginia don't know much, but uh, 
according to my calculation from where at my, you know, physician, I didn't. I'm with you. I'm from a little town in Louisiana, North Louisiana, and it's like until I got out and saw the rest of the world, I that's all I knew. It was my reality. You know, that's all I knew. Wow, this place is cool. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, right. (laughs) That's all I knew was this little redneck town. You know, so I def I know where you're coming from. Yeah. So okay, let's uh, let's fast forward. Um, You start busking at what age? I would say uh, early to mid twenties. Because I was in West Virginia in a band, and um, I played in a band called 600 Pounds of Sin. And they're like, it's great for this slash jammy sort of type of band. And um, I kind of just started playing with them a lot for a few years. Well, yeah, for a few years. And then um, I just, you know, West Virginia wasn't good for me, so I left. In what way? What do you mean? Well, I was just like staying with someone who was mentally abusive and I was just c- caught up in things that I shouldn't have been involved in and and I just needed I needed some inspiration for mm. life, for living, you know. Mm-hmm. And I ran into this to this woman, her name's Emily. She was visiting uh our, the neighbors of the trailer I was living in. And she saw me and she was like, I'm getting you out of here. And she left for like a month and then she came back. And then she, you know, she was like a transient. She had like, she she lived in her van. She had a, a, you know, a couple chickens and mm-hmm. she would like go get bird food and feed it to the chickens. And, and then, you know, like, and she had like these really beautiful dogs, like a dingo-ish looking dog. And, uh, um, and they were both rescues. But anyways, like, she came back, she threw me in the van, she's like, we're getting out of here. And then we got out of there, and then we started hitchhiking together. And um, when I left West Virginia, I was kind of stuck around on the East Coast, like, where I just, like, you know, I was riding trains um, and hitchhiking. Like, I think one of the first train I actually got on was in Cumberland, Maryland, in this cute little train town. And... um, Emily had all this money and she ended up losing it. And she had like two grand or something. She ended up losing it and like, it was it was a mess, it was hilarious. But um, <laughs> she like, we got we hopped on the train, she her hat fe- flew off. And I'm like, oh my gosh, we're gonna, I'm gonna get it. I'm gonna get your hat. And so like, I jump off the train and the train stops. And then so like, I'm like running back to look for her hat, which I never found. But it was like, you know, I tried <laughs> and then I went back and it was like a scene from a movie kind of because it starts up and it starts to roll off and she like holds her hand out. She's yeah. like, she's like, grab my hand. And then I got like jumped on the train and like grabbed her hand and like, and then she like pulled me up and her knee was kind of bad. So she like, we like fell back on the train and it was a cool experience. So like legit hopping trains <laughs> yeah. from place to place. Yeah. That, that's, it, it sounds so romantic to hear those stories, but man, I got to think that's a grind though. Or were you just like, what's the book that by Jack Kerouac, On the Road? On the Road, yeah, Have yeah, you read it? yeah, yeah. Are you, are you just like living it and loving it? At the time, I definitely was living it and loving it because I feel like I subdued my myself for a few years just with my decisions of bad making and uh so I, f- I feel like I was finally living again and I was experiencing things mm-hmm. and not just like in one little spot. Yeah. And so everything, w- I almost felt like everything was new again. And especially in that sort of that sort of way and style of living is because nobody really thinks that that's a thing that goes on because we get so caught up in doing our everyday normal-ish sort of stuff, you know, like mm-hmm. where you go to work and you make money. But there's like this whole underground the rules of society yeah the rules of society and uh there's like this just like this whole other world happening right beneath the surface right i gotta think though like you're going through all that and it's like no worries and and uh tell me if i'm wrong but like i'm sure you're you're you don't have a lot of money at the time because you know you're hopping trains and playing music on the street for money were you were you happy doing that though I was for a while um, until I wasn't, you know. Mm-hmm. Like, I feel like that's way. That's just the way it is with us as being humans in general. It's our complex. Yeah. And uh, so what makes us not perfect is uh, we we get what we want and then we don't want it anymore. Yeah. Or we're like we're out. We've outgrown this. Or you know, I've outgrown this. And 
then it's on to something new. Yeah. And I felt like my, you know, and there's only so much that you can learn from something. Yeah. Before you kind of, it's just like kicking a dead horse. Or like I, it's like I'm trying to fix this to be happy, but I can't fix it. And so I guess it's time to move on. Mm -hmm. And so I took what I got out of that because the lifestyle of that is really hard, you know. And a lot of those people who are out there traveling, they're not, um, not all of them are broken, but they, you know, they they need. They need help a little bit, and um, they need therapy. <laughs> yeah, right, right. We all need therapy. All do, okay, yeah. let's be honest, everyone, everyone out there, please get a therapist. It's awesome, and it'll change your life. Yeah, it's no like, I know millionaires that have the same issues that that guy or gal on the street are having. You know, yeah. so the money and the things that we are taught by society is a success. We all have this brain that runs twenty four seven. You know, and yeah. until we really understand, try to understand it, you're you're chasing that thing, you know. And for me, like I always, I thought there was this destination you could get to, and this equals happy. If I check this box, this box, and this box, well, then I'm gonna be happy. And I did. I checked all the boxes, but I couldn't. I wasn't happy. You yeah. know, I'm like fuck. Okay. So then I go on this soul searching journey, and what I've learned, and I'm still learning, is like the journey that is the destination. And there is, even though you achieve this or you overcome this challenge, there's going to be another one waiting. It's you true. Know? So it's like the perception of how we're viewing those things. You know what I mean? Absolutely. And it's just, and it's, sometimes I feel like it's hard for people to look at things from other angles and being like, oh, well, this is the angle that this person's looking at it. it they don't know how to put themselves in other people's shoes, too, as well, I feel like. No, I agree with that. I agree with that. And I'll say this, like psilocybin, man, that is, it's something like Johns Hopkins and it got a bad rap. Magic mushrooms got a bad rap in the seventies, you know, but it's so therapeutic. And so I mentioned Johns Hopkins, the MAPS organization. There's a lot of credible um, places that are showing the benefits of psilocybin, of LSD. You know, the, of course, set and setting is the most important. Like, but for me, that um, opened my eyes, changed my, allowed me to change my perceptions and view things differently. Yeah. You know. Um, so let, let's. I, I want to stay on this busking thing for a little bit because I I went. So I did a I did a uh, I did a little trip down to Terlingua. Have you have you heard of that? It's down around Big Bend, down in Southwest Texas. Oh yeah, no, I've, I've never been there. And so at, at home, like I'm a real estate investor and, and I have my business going there, this Converse Cowboy thing is kind of a side hustle slash scratch my own itch thing. But I was like, you know what? I want to get back to that grind mentality like when I had nothing, you know? And Cause I feel like that's when we're really working when we don't know what we don't know. Yeah. And so I took $50, my guitar and, and a backpack full of clothes. And I just wanted to see if I could do the busking thing. I mean, I'm an amateur at best, right? <laughs> and I can play a few covers. And, uh, and so I did. For two weeks, I brought $50 up to all my credit cards at home and saw what came up. And the fucking mental chatter just started rolling, you know? You can't do this. Um, and I wanted to go home on, like, day two. Like, I was beating myself up. But, man, that turned into one of the cheapest vacations I've ever had and like I didn't have a tent I didn't have nothing to I had no room to stay in like I was sleeping outside under the stars and uh, so I really had to focus on one of my th I think gratitude is a superpower when we can really tap into finding things to be grateful for man it makes all of the worries go away it makes all of the fears just diminish you know um, but again it comes down to perception and how we view those things yeah absolutely right um, so I'll make a long story longer. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, so I came out of that and I, I you know, I had enough money. I made, I got down to $11 and I'm questioning what the <laughs> fuck am I doing? Why am I here? Like I start rationing like, okay, I've got coffee. There was $2 and 44 cents. This is a ghost town, really just a tourist attraction, but they had this big long porch set up and it's for live music. So really it wasn't like I was grinding it out like a, a musician would do in the streets of New Orleans or Seattle. It's kind of like a spring break, like a country club version of busking, you know? Yeah. It was kind of set up for it, but still it allowed me to kind of experience it a little bit. And man, I had so much respect for guys like you or gals like you and folks that did that for real. You know, sitting out there and just playing. It took some training, for mm -hmm. sure. Tell me about that then, like, 
your first day, can you remember your first day out there playing for money? Um, well, you know, when I first took off, I didn't really bring a guitar with me. I just like had my backpack and I would always carry a knife um, and I always wore it to where everyone could see it, <laughs> especially right when you're hitchhiking. Um, so you didn't plan on busking, like that wasn't the goal? Like, that wasn't out? the goal at first. It was more just like Operation Save Sierra. <laughs> you know, like. And then eventually I got used to that sort of lifestyle. And then um, I just was like, oh, I'm gonna bring my guitar with me. And then I just started bringing around a, a nylon string one, so then it's not too heavy. Mm -hmm. And honestly, I never really had a case for it. And I would just like, would just tie a string around it or something and put it on my back. And um, I just throw it on the train. It was never an issue, you know, because it was super light. You know how like nylon string guitars are, right. the classical ones, they're yeah. super light. Um, and that's what I used to actually play for the longest time. Because I was super against picks for whatever reason. I was just like, people like use a pick, I'll be like, no, I'm not using a pick. <laughs> I was just like, stubborn, young, you know. Yeah. Uh, but... Um, were you writing then? Like, were you playing originals on the streets or were you playing covers? Honestly, I started playing covers. And I really, I really looked up to buskers. You know, I was just like, wow, these people are so cool. They look really cool. They sound even better. Mm -hmm. And they just like know all these amazing songs. Because, you know, at first I thought they were writing them, and, I, and then I was, you know, I'd ask them about them, but they just listened to really old music. And I'm like, well, these are, you know, these are old musicians that we love. And then so I, I started diving into that and um, exploring the realms of old musicianry. And just like, I was like, I just remember the first time I've ever really heard Buskers. I was like, why are people playing music like this? Like, why is this here? Why isn't this on a stage? Why isn't this, you know, in the spotlight, right? Because it's so genuine too. Like you can like really feel the rawness and the genuineness mm -hmm. of it. And uh, and I said I wanted that. And then you know I took some practicing. And then no, I didn't really know that many songs. And then I started learning songs. I started learning them and learning them and learning them. And uh, so what are you doing? You're sitting around for hours a day playing and singing and just learning stuff. Learning songs. And then with all, other people, or with, are you are you alone? Well, when I traveled, I usually traveled and I had uh, either one or a group of road dogs, which that's what you call your traveling partners is a road dog. <laughs> right on. And, um, and I just started playing and, and learning songs. And then I, now I'm here today. So what about the voice? <laughs> you have the you have a very unique voice. It's it's like got this vintage feel. Like I don't you can't compare Sierra Farrell to anybody really. Like the voice, the look, the vibe. It's you're you're very unique in that. Is that that's something I feel like that's developed over time. But it it, it comes with like this confidence, right? Like you can't, it's a confidence that you can't. I'm a big believer in positive thinking, but that's something that you can tell is earned. Right, like the confidence that you have on stage, and um, that you see it, that you see and hear in your music. How much of that is from those early days and putting in the time and really grinding your way through it to get to where you are today? A lot, and I also feel, um, you know, I feel like I always joke around. I got the voice that I have because of all the pain and suffering that I went through, and also a really long neck. <laughs> because, I <do. laughs> because I have a really long neck, but anyways, um, you know, it's, you definitely got to put in your time. You have yeah. to, you need to, I've been singing since forever, ever since like elementary, middle, high school, always been involved in music stuff. Voice, voice lessons along the way, or is that just natural? Like, is that, like, I, I think about your voice like a culture wall. It's so distinct. It's so unique. And yes, I, I've interviewed him and he, he did talk about like, tweaking it and, and changing it Absolutely. in certain ways, but like, is that the same for you? Have you changed it along the way? Yeah, you know, um, I've actually really hated my voice for a long time. And, and as you know, as in, as in, as people, we have like different opinions all the time and, the, and it's constantly changing. And, uh, you know, I, I used to think that vibrato was not very attractive. I didn't think it was nice. I was like, I don't like vibrato, but I also listen to radio pop music constantly and they don't really do that as much. And, um, and you know, it's taken every, you know, all the paths that I've taken, that I've lived to be where I am now. 
But I will say that there was an incident that happened when I was a very young child that kind of made a difference on my voice, on my on my vocals uh, that I feel. So whenever I was maybe four-ish or five, I can't I can't even remember. But um, I got my tonsils and adenoids taken out. And um, it's like a pairing thing that they usually do. I, I wasn't aware of. And mm. the adenoids are like a sinus thing. Right. And so when they took the, uh, they took my tonsils and adenoids out, I talked like this. I talked like Minnie Mouse. <laughs> and like, and I was like so, I was so sad and depressed because you know I couldn't ever really talk around my family or my friends because they would always make fun of me. And I had to relearn how to how to talk again and how to breathe again because. I couldn't blow out candles. I couldn't blow up balloons. And then so I started going to seeing a, a physical therapist. And uh, so then I did that all the time. I just, I practiced breathing stuff, breathing, the ways of breathing, and also just how to reuse my my mouth again and like right, you know, my how throat. To train how, to, muscles, yeah, yeah. how to train it and to sound like a normal person, I, I thought, anyways. And, uh, I think it gave my vocal cords a six pack. <laughs> <laughs> That's a great way to put it. So do you think, you think maybe not for you specifically, but like in general, is, some, is something like voice, can that be taught or is that God given? I definitely feel like people are, are um, given things by God all the time. It's just rather if you use it. Right. Because it's definitely, you know, I could have uh, been born in a family that comes from a long line of beautiful singers, but if I don't practice it, yeah. it's not gonna it's not gonna do any good. Right. You, you got it's like a muscle. You got to work it out to, for it to. Yeah. Come back with full force. Yeah, we were at, we were talking about this yesterday. We I, th I think about this a lot. Like people say, well, you can do anything if you put your mind to it. And and again, I'm a firm believer in the power of positive thinking. But if I said at 39, today's my birthday, 39 years old today. Happy birthday. Yeah. At the age of 39, if I wanted to go play in the NBA at six feet, 39 years old, probably not going to happen. Right? So at what, and it's a question. It's like, I'm all about playing the long game. Like, play the long game, show up consistently every single day and good stuff will happen. But at what time, at what point do you realize, like, man, this isn't, like, I need to pivot. I need to maybe go down a different road. Does that make sense? Yeah, but um, because at the end of the day, it's it really just turns out. Do you have fans? Are they like supporting you? Mm -hmm. Do you have you know like? And it doesn't make you happy because if it makes you happy, and other people are being like you're not doing a very good job, then sure, make it a hobby. Don't like try to make it a career. Um, but, you know, it's just, I know that's like, it must be tough for people because, you know, like you could think that you're doing a really good job. You're like, I just did, I just did the best song ever. And then like, you just get all this terrible feedback from it and like, no right. one likes it. And you're like, what am I doing wrong? I love this song <laughs> like this. I put my heart and soul into this. Yeah. And I know that can be really soul crushing, but maybe you just weren't ready yet. You know, like maybe you just needed to practice more or like. Maybe it's not for you, but it's just you won't ever really know until you try. Exactly. Exactly. And I, I'll continue to contemplate that question. You know, I'm just like, man, like something that I would really want to do. Like I think about it in my own life and then also in others, like giving advice to other people. It's like I want to say, yeah, man, I can <laughs> put your head down and do it and don't let anybody tell you otherwise. And I do firmly believe that. But at the same time, like there's that other little voice in the back of my head. It's like like the cynical, you know, the cynical side of it. It's like, are we being real with ourselves? And, and I'm getting caught up in my own thoughts right now. Like I just go back and forth with, with that idea that yes, keep going. And, and, and it may take 10 years. It's true though. It may take 10, like, yeah. So time plays a big factor in that, you know, but I do I feel like when you can find the thing that you love to do and other people find value in it, you fucking win. Like, you win. It's true. You know, according <laughs> to the life that we have, the, according to the society we live in, you know. So true. Um, 
I'm going to go, man, I want to hang on the busking thing a little bit more. I'm from Louisiana, so I want to hear some cool Louisiana stories, some cool New Orleans stories that you have from your time down there. How long were you in New Orleans for? Well, I lived there uh, technically for about uh, uh, six months, and then... Were you down in the quarter? Yeah, I lived on, like, music. I was really close to St. Rock. I was, like, on music, and I forget what that other street is. But I could walk to St. Rock. <laughs> And, um, you know, it was, it's too much of a good thing for me. I no way like, I could live there, dude. I was like, I have to go. <laughs> well, like, needing to make money really, like, kept me from uh, going off the deep end. Needing to be like, okay, well, and, and my, you know, my drive, because I was like, okay, I have to step up and, like, go busk for at least six hours to make, you know, to eventually make rent. So that's what kind of like kept me being like, I'm not gonna mess up. I live in a house. I need to pay my rent, and so you know. Uh, did that your crew come with you from Seattle, or did you find new folks? No, down there? no. At this time, I think I lived in New. I lived in New Orleans. This was before I went to Seattle. Okay. And uh, well, like went there to like be a busker, but like I've been there before, to. Um, to just like hang out and like I went to folk life that was like a thing that was up in Seattle okay and that kind of changed my life but honestly like the experience that I had in New Orleans really helped set me up to like live and sit pre sitting pretty in Seattle busking financially um, yeah because it's well and it's like the busking in Seattle I felt like is better in general well, for me personally it's different for everyone yeah uh, because there's not as many people for one, there's not as much competition because you know how busking is in New Orleans, right? Yeah, I wanted, yeah, I wanted to touch on that, like how competitive it's that is. It's so like competitive. Everybody kind of has their corner, right? Like they have their spot. Mm -hmm. How was that like trying to come in as the new the newcomer? Well, I mean, people literally sit out at that spot all night long. Like they will have someone from their band like go and sit there, and then they'll you know they'll trade off. Be like maybe someone will come like at two or something and and then someone will come and relieve you at like five and let you go get some rest or something you know like you know you would just like trade the timings or whatever but but you know are they then, sitting there playing while they're, they're no si they're just sitting there just holding they're the just spot. holding the spot down and if somebody if another musician comes in what do you what do they do well they'll be like well we've been here this whole time and you know like i feel i just feel like you know other musicians would step up and be like this isn't right you, you're you're banned you know, you like it'll get to the point to where you know everyone will know that you're a terrible person and like stealing spots from people, and then they, right. then you'll just pretty much just get booted because yeah. at, at the end of the day, everyone's kind of doing the same thing. You know, they're just trying to like hang out, have a good day, yeah, play music, yeah, you know, <laughs> and make some money. Right. So okay, New Orleans to Nashville. Or did you go, was there another stop I mean, along the there way? was a few times where I went across country a couple times in between them, you know? Like, I was like, okay, I'm just going to go hitchhike or I'm going to go go with these people for a while and, like, caravan with them. And, um, well, right before, right when I left Seattle for good and I knew I wasn't going back for a while anyways. Yeah? I went, that's what, I went to New Orleans for, like, a month and a half. And that's when I wrote In Dreams. And then... What year would that have been? That... I'd have to look on the actual video. I don't want to give, I mean, I can guess, I would say maybe six, five years, five years ago. That's so. wild. So how much has that song changed since, from then to like this album? I feel like, well, the recording is definitely different than the live version of it. But mm -hmm. also, I hate to break it to y'all, I wrote the song a long time ago. That's when I first wrote the song. So of course it's gonna be different. And I felt like from where I just wrote it, when I just write songs, I'm like on fire, you know? I'm like, yeah, I love this song. It's my new song. And uh, so, and that was my new song. And so that's why I feel like that uh, recording and version went over so well because it's so raw and genuine because I right. really and like genuinely was like, I love this new song. <laughs> and uh, it's just, it's, I'm never gonna be able to sing it like that again because it's not the new song yet anymore, you know? Mm -hmm. Um, so I'm going to read a quote 
that you said in another interview, you said, I want my, I want my music to be like my mind is all over the place. Yep, it's true. <laughs> so you, you can't like say Sierra Farrell, that's country music, that's folk music, that's rock. Like it's a blend of a lot of different things. So when you sit down to write, like, are you saying, I'm going to write this song, I'm going, and, and I want to, I want to dig in, we'll, I'll just segue into like your, the songwriting process, like what that's like for you. Um, or do you have a theme in mind? Like what's, what's the process? What's the setting? What, what, what time of day? Like, can you set it up? Well, these days anymore, I was never really that huge into songwriting. I was just, I would sit down and be like, okay, I need to write a song or like, I want to write a song and I feel like I'm pretty quick with a hook. Like I can write hooks all day long. But then when it comes to like molding the song for it to be perceived uh, and taking seriously or just people comprehending it, it's a little harder for me. Mm. Because because I am all over the place. Because it's like maybe not so much as I'm getting older because I'm starting to like even out more a little bit, I feel like. But especially when I was younger, I. I was also wanted to just be maybe different. Just like I wanted to like approach it differently. And it's definitely benefited me uh, in my life that I live now. Um, but like writing songs, it can, Jeremiah took me like a week, you know, like, or, or maybe it was a day. I can't remember. They all start to kind of, West Virginia Waltz was a day. That was really? like, I was like, I'm going to write West Virginia Waltz. I got out of the car, got the guitar out of the back on whenever we got gas, and I wrote the West Virginia Waltz. Um, but why'd you do it whenever I wrote that? Uh, I had the hook forever. Why'd you do it? Oh, why'd you do it? Why did you fall in love? And then I would just like, would just rap that randomly sometimes. Or, or, you know, like I would joke around, my friend would be in love with someone and I'd be like, why'd you do this? You know, like, <laughs> and then eventually, um, like years, fast forward to a few years later, uh, I started hanging out with CW Stone King and he was like showing me like these cool chords. And I'm like, oh, that's cool. I want to switch these around and make it kind of my own in a way. And uh, so then like I kind of ended up writing the rest of the song and then I remembered that hook and I'm like oh yeah that song I'm gonna put this in that song it's got that cool vibe that I that it yeah. needed so are you are you like if you can demystify the songwriting process for those that that may be watching this like are you keeping a running tab of notes like like you're mentioning that hook right there like was that in a notebook sitting somewhere or it's in the Rolodex the, upstairs the <laughs> um, are you but, sitting down with pen and paper these days, I've been doing it a little bit more. These days, I, I mean, and that's kind of my problem is like, it's like, Sierra, just sit down, get a pen, write it down, you know? But then I'm I'm just so flighty and stubborn and uh, at least I can admit it. That <laughs> <laughs> uh, sometimes I just get like lost in the madness of like, what is going on? It's just like, what, it's like, what year is it? Who am I? <laughs> Um, well, I hear, you know, I, I said, it was, I think it was Cor Blunt that, that said that, like, a songwriter's antenna is always up. Like, you're looking at life through a different lens than most everybody else. Like, you're catching things and picking up on things. And I'm going to, like, use that as a segue into Bells of Every Chapel. You were watching a movie? I was watching, I think this was right when the pandemic started happening, maybe. Mm-hmm. No, it was a little bit before because Oliver, my friend who I wrote that song with, would definitely not would have wanted to hang out. Um, it was a little bit before the pandemic, maybe. My time, my time frame is just like zero to 60. It's so, it's so terrible. But anyways, I think I just got back from a run. I was just like playing on the road and I came home and. I was staying at my fiddle player at the time, Nate Leaf's house, and um, his partner, Audrey McAlpine, she was just like, she watches The Crown. It's like a TV show on mm -hmm. uh, Netflix about the Queen of uh, Queen, Queen of England. And uh, so the Queen goes, from the bells of every chapel. And I'm like, I'm writing that song. I'm writing the bells of every chapel. And... 
I started writing it then, it turned out to be completely nothing like that at all. Like it was, I just started writing it. I started getting the wheel rolling, you know? Mm -hmm. And then I just like, it kept staying with me and I was like, oh, I gotta write this song. And it was like a week or so later and I hit up my friend and I'm like, can we sit down and I sing some stuff and you help me find it on the guitar? Because I'm not really a guitar player. I hate to break it to everybody. I play the guitar, yes. I do it in my own way, yes. But when it comes to knowing scales, knowing your arpeggios, <laughs> knowing, <laughs> knowing, just like knowing your chords and stuff, I am not the one to go to. But I am I am really good with shapes. So like, and there's only so many shapes on the guitar. So you just like slide it around. Uh -huh. And I'm like, oh, well, this goes with this. Okay, the logic is there. I feel it, right. you know. <laughs> but like, it's not really imprinted. Um, I don't trailed off from what I was genuine. So how long did it take to write that one? It's on the new well, record, uh, Bells of Every Chapel. Bells of Every Chapel. It took me, once I sat down with Oliver, um, you know, it took us just like a day. <laughs> we were really? just like, yeah. And we were like, this is, this is it. And I, and I thanked him for it, and we did our percentage cuts, and it was awesome. And we also worked on another tune together that we wrote within the, the couple-week frame that we were hanging out at the time. And he was like, brought, brought this mandolin tune to the table, and he was saying how much he loved this mandolin tune, and he played it for me, and I fell in love with it. It was a waltz, and it's still a waltz but probably a little mildly different whenever I recorded it. And I just put a bunch of words to it. He helped me with the words a little bit. And I just fell in love with it. And it's probably one of my favorite songs on the record. And that one's called uh, Whispering Waltz. Right on. How does, I'm curious to know, like, can you give listeners a peek behind the curtain? So like, I'll go back to Bells of Every Chapel. Billy Strings plays on that. Mm -hmm. Big name right now. How does that happen? Like, how does a collaboration like that happen? Well, I just put some fillers out there, and I know a guy who's recording him. He's also recording my record. And we're, we happen to be on the same record label. And so I just asked him, asked Gary Petroza if he could ask Billy if he would be on my record. Mm -hmm. And he did, and he agreed to it. And that's all she wrote. <laughs> Are y'all buds? Like y'all hang out and jam? No, unfortunately not. Not so not as much as I want. Right. But you know, he's he's touring a lot these days. Yeah. And he's also always with his partner and always fishing. <laughs> yeah. I, I yeah, you, you just get on his Instagram and you can see he's either at on a tour, on a you know, a stage somewhere or he's in a boat somewhere fishing it seems like. Yeah, I, yep, it's true, and uh, I think his partner actually works with him too. Like she's ma she's managing him. So. Oh, right on. That's really cool. What a what a nice uh, what a nice little thing to have. Yeah, like the collaboration side of it. Like I'm I'm so curious. Like does that interfere? And I guess this is more like a songwriting question. Like, would you rather write alone, or do you prefer co-writing, or are you just okay with either one and how it turns out? Well, you know, I've been having some weird difficulties with some people about co-writing um, and like wanting percentages when they don't really deserve it. And it's been kind of crippling for me in a way because I've been I've been moving forward to where I do. I have been really enjoying co-writing more because, like, you know, you love writing by yourself and writing songs until you don't. And then and then you need kind of need that little kick in the butt to get you get the gears rolling and moving in the direction of writing again why is that like does it open your eyes to to, to see things different or feel things a little yeah. bit different because you know everyone has their own essence their own self right. and they bring they always bring something different to the table from their vision or just the sounds that they're going for um and it's i'm as i'm getting older i'm really just starting to appreciate that and and willing to branch out and work with as many people as possible. I want to mention another quote. You got quite a few here that I wrote down um, from other interviews. Um, I don't know where this one came from. I read it in an article, um, but it says, Sierra Farrell is a timeless artist 
that is perfect for this time. And it's, it is, that's a good way to say it. It's like you have this vintage slash contemporary vibe going. You're very unique in that. And we mentioned it, like the confidence you have earlier. How do you avoid like the comparison game? And I know a lot of people struggle with this. I get the DMs. Hell, I struggle with it at times, you know, where you may see somebody else or uh, doing something and then we get like this imposter syndrome. Yeah. You know, you know what I mean? Mockingbird syndrome. <laughs> yeah. Like, how do you stay true and like stay so confident in who you are? Um, well, I feel like we are a lot of people. We're like, you know, people who we grew up with, people who helped raise those people who have exposed us to wonderful or terrible experiences. In a sense, you know, we are, at the end of the day, ourselves. But we also need to give credit to the people who have helped help create us in a way. Mm -hmm. Not like not that they created us, but they... Um, they contributed. They contributed. They, mm -hmm. like, they left their fingerprint in a way. To where make, maybe you're like, actually, I really don't like that. I'm not going to incorporate that in my life. Or, or you really love it and you respect it. And, um, yeah, life is wild. You know, we're, we're all just learning and growing. And yeah, and it's ever-evolving, right? It's like ever-evolving. We ever-evolve our awareness and into the, the things we know. And it's like people ask me, like, what is success? Like, what is your definition of success? Well, to me, it's like... If I did my best, and this is such a cheesy cliche answer, but if I did my best and I know I did, that's a, that's a success. Yeah. My best is going to continue to change and I'd have to keep seeking that out, whatever it may be. Yeah. Does that make sense? Yeah, it does make sense. Um, and it's also like remembering to let go of toxic people too, because I feel like also whenever you're on your way and you feel like you're like, man, I'm doing awesome, I'm succeeding, I'm doing what? You, you know, you're doing what you love, and then people can see that, and they, they get mad, you know? Like, sometimes people mm -hmm. just get so mad about stuff like that because Envy they're... jealousy. Because they're, maybe they're not doing so well, or... And they'll just... just they'll try to poison the water hole. <laughs> so how do you do that? How do you handle it? Is it just a clean break and you walk away, or...? It's hard, especially, like, when you love or uh, you value that person, mm. and then turns out that they're completely different or you know or you've like had conversations with these people even you know and they just don't change or they say they'll change or they'll get help or whatever and then they never do and then it's just um it's i just want to you know say always try to be the light but just remember to uh try not to gather up all the moths <laughs> because you know like they'll just they'll weigh you down they'll weigh you down just just try to remember to stay true to yourself and also try not to hurt those people because you know they're prop they're going through their own trauma and they're you know like just, that's the thing sierra like we never see what's going on good or bad whether we yeah. view them as successful or unsuccessful we don't know what's going on in that person's head no matter what mask they have on and i'm Absolutely. not referring to a mask for COVID. i'm talking about this <laughs> mask that we present to the rest of the world you know yeah um like crazy fucked up thoughts like i'm sitting there i'll, I'll expose i'll be vulnerable i'll expose my own stuff like i'm standing there talking to this old lady the other day and uh she's i don't know 85 plus and like i'm like what if i punched her in the mouth right now where the fuck does this crazy <laughs> oh thought come God. from why, why, i don't want to punch her nor <laughs> am i going to but it's like what the fuck you know like where, it's do like, where does this come thoughts from come from yeah satan satan yeah <laughs> alan watts do you listen to any alan watts he's a uh, philosopher but um, he has a pretty good bit on a lot of uh, things like that but w one of them on YouTube is around that like where do thoughts come from fuck I don't know I totally I'm totally there with you though there's been times like you'll see something happen or there's almost a car accident but then like you Im you actually just imagine it and it's and you're like why would I even do that yeah or some you know sometimes you see a, a bunch of cars come in you're like i could just step out into this and like it'll be over you know yeah, <laughs> like, it's right. just like 
what is happening yeah. inside that's making these evil thoughts? Or? And that is our reality. You know, our reality is based on this narrative, the, these stories that we tell ourselves, good or bad, positive, negative. And yeah, like, so I lean hard into meditation. I lean hard into like uh, journaling. I write just about every day just to explore my own thoughts and to get that stuff out on paper. Um, that doesn't mean it, it's, it sl slows those crazy thoughts from coming, <laughs> yeah. but I'm able to recognize them a little bit more, you know, versus just being on autopilot and going, going through life, not really tr understanding any of what's happening. Yeah. You know? Which that's definitely a thing. It's like you can like, you're aware of these things, but if you don't like confront them and deal with them, it could turn into something that it didn't have to be. Yeah, like whenever those thoughts just stay unaware, like I have no conscious um, awareness around any of it. Like it's it's just happening like on this loop, you know, yeah. and I'm waking up at the waking up the same way. I go to I drive the same route to work and I'm having the same conversations and the same thoughts keep going because that's I am creating my reality unconsciously. And so what I've learned is like consciously or unconsciously, we are creating our life, our future, you know? And so I choose, and again, I'm a human, so I don't get it perfect. Like I'm not trying to preach to anybody out there, but I do feel a difference whenever I do take the time to meditate, when I do take the time to journal and really explore where my mind's at, what are my intentions, you know? And, and that doesn't mean, that doesn't mean everything's going to line up with my agenda, but the lens in which I look at it, like I view it as whatever may happen, this is happening for me. Yeah. I was on the way to a horse show at like four in the morning, I get a flat on my trailer and, and I chose to smile about it. You know, I wasn't pissed or anything like that because for whatever reason that happened for me. And when I was on that Terralingua trip down in, uh, when I was doing the busking thing, somebody said it in a way it made a lot of sense. He didn't say like everything happens for a reason. He said, I have to believe that everything happening right now is the best possible thing that can happen. So simple, maybe cheesy. I love that. But when you can look at it through that lens, it just changes your whole attitude, changes your life, essentially your personality, right? Yeah, well, you know, I'm actually going through a thing where I, Especially like when I'm in a relationship sort of stance, I, I always like think of the worst case scenario we of what's all do happening. That. Well, that's default, like the default. Yeah, it's mode. like yeah, human complex or something. Mm -hmm. But I always think of the worst case scenario, and I it's just easy to let ideas grab a hold of you and just run down the hall with it, and you know, and it's I don't know, get help, get therapy. <laughs> Yeah, it's, I, I feel like therapy has helped me a lot and I know it could help everyone else. So, Well, the difference is like most people hold everything in and I did for a long time. It's a problem. I did for a long time because we don't, uh, you know, that mask that we present to the world, we don't want to, we're, we're trying to show our perfect self. We don't want to expose anything imperfect and I think ego plays a role in that, you know. Um, but what I've learned is like by opening up and being vulnerable, like it, it exposes who you are and then more people align with that. Yeah. And I, I try to stay away from the word truth. I think too many fucking gurus out there use the word truth, like find your truth. But when you can do it's true to you and be okay if people don't align with it, man, I look at that as like I'm grateful, like because that's fine. Like I don't... I don't view it and say, like, I don't give a shit what people think. I look at it and say, man, I'm okay with it. It's a difference. There is a, a, a difference because being okay with it, it's fine. We're going to go different routes. Saying I don't give a shit, I think those people really do give a shit. Yeah. I mean, there's definitely some truth in that because I've just, I've known so many people who are like, man, tattoos are for mutants and body piercings, disgusting, like that's gross. And then like years go by and then they're covered in tattoos and they have piercings. Yeah. I also feel like sometimes people verbally say stuff like that about people or about things that they actually kind of secretly kind of like. You know what I'm talking about? It's, it's, like, it's like they actually kind of, they're like, that's disgusting, that's terrible. But then they're actually like, 
I kind of like that. <laughs> God, what is that Carl Jung? I, I did a little poster quote on this the other day. It says, what irritates us about others tells us a lot about ourselves. You know what I mean? So yeah. like, what an, and I really took time and thought about that. And I was like, fuck, that's so true. <laughs> yeah. That's so true. So how did Sierra Fer Farrell get on my radar? I'll plug those guys at Western AF. I met Mike Bonata, uh, I don't know, sometime this spring. And uh, watched the video that those guys did. Funny motherfucker. Like, he's hilarious. Hats off to what he's doing over there. Um, if, if you guys haven't seen any of their videos, I highly recommend go check that out. Western AF, they're on YouTube. Um, tell me about that, like meeting Mike. How, how was that experience? Well, we just hung out in Laramie, okay. uh, Wyoming, because that's where he lives. His hometown, yeah. Yeah. And we did a couple more videos. And uh, he came with us to our show in Lions. Okay. And... It was just so, it was so fun. And he's a trip. Fun time. Thanks, Dad. <laughs> it's so funny. <laughs> I called still going him, strong. Yeah, I called him the other day. He's like, hey, Dad. <laughs> I'm like, you can't, he's one of those, like, you have to like him. It's true. Like, you know, there's those people, like, where you either love him or you hate him. You, you like him, like, you love him. You know? You, I definitely, I definitely do. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. So Mike put me on your radar. And then I saw the, the, the tune you put out. It was on YouTube, like, at your house or something. I'd do it again. Oh, yeah. Um, that tune is, is, do you want to hear how I wrote that tune? I would love to, yeah. Okay, so I actually, I wrote that with uh, Nate, and Le Nate Leith and Audrey McAlpine. And, I mean, I came up with, like, the bridge and the chorus and stuff, but like, you know, they helped get me spinning in the direction of like what to do with it and s what to do with the verses. So she was, Audrey, she was reading to me um, a thing about Michelangelo, the, the, you know, the painter, and he was into men. And, you know, I actually never knew that. So that's kind of cool. Me neither. And, but you know, back then it was probably even worse to be found out that you're gay. And, so he would write these poems uh, and stuff to his to his lover at the time, and he would say stuff, you know, I wish I was the jacket on your back, and I um, I wish uh, I was the shoes upon your feet, and you know stuff like that, and then so then I wrote, I do it again. <laughs> and what's the hat? Like you have this sick hat that you're wearing in the video. The fur hat. Oh my gosh, I got that in Port Townsend. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. I got that in Port Townsend at this little cool vintage thrifty spot. Um, and it was it looked a lot better whenever I bought it, but now it's kind of falling apart and it smells funny. <laughs> <laughs> you know? <laughs> but it's, it's, uh, it's, it's a got good character. Hat. That's what we call that character. I'm gonna ask you one more about songwriting. So if you have any advice for a young songwriter out there um, that, that may be getting started, what advice would that be? Well, you can write a song about anything, literally anything. It doesn't, I mean, seriously, it's all about phrasing, delivery. Um, it, in my experience, it is a little easier to write a song about something that you've kind of experienced in a way but it doesn't always have to be about yourself. It could be about someone else. You can be watching someone from a, from a distance for a really long time, you know? And you kind of, you can create this story about this person or like mm -hmm. see something like, like they always wear a red hat or something and like kind of incorporate that in a way. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, just don't be scared to explore and explore all genres, find your voice because you know, that's why there's genres for a reason. Is because someone was like, I don't like this. I want to do something different. Right. <laughs> you know, like, and, um, yeah, just don't be scared. What about, do you ever face any resistance? I know a lot of artists do that, whether you call it writer's block or just resistance to sit down at a blank, blank page. Do you experience that? And if so, like, how do you overcome that? Absolutely. Um, it's scary, right? What I've been trying to do a lot more recently, fingers crossed that I keep it up, uh, 
that I've been writing down stuff and it doesn't even matter if it rhymes, if it matches what the idea was, just write it down. Mm. I think it's a huge thing Bob Dylan did. He would just like con continuously just keep writing and then he would like have all these stacks of papers and you can just go through the papers, pick out your favorite things about it and then put it in the song. Mm. And um, well, How are you doing that? In a notebook? In a notebook, yeah. Are you like organizing it in any way or are you just uh, writing? I just write. I need, you know, I've, my friend Emily, who I was talking about before, she was always like, Sierra, write a journal, keep a journal, write a journal every day. Like, yeah. I've just never been a journal person. Why is that, you think? I don't know. I just, I don't know. I, it's, I think it's probably time to be, though, so then I can start documenting stuff. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think I started journaling. So I have one back from like 2007. That's wild. <laughs> That's pretty far and back. And then like it was for a few weeks and then you look in the journal and then 2009 is when I picked it up again for a few weeks and then 2011. So it was like every two years I would pick it up and then it wasn't until about two years ago. Like I really started journaling every, every day and I don't look back at them. Like I don't, I don't, never read them. I never read them, you know, and, and sometimes I'll even write. Like, even like in the journal, like I'll kind of like hold back a little bit. But then there's those days I'm like, all right, I'm gonna just let it all out. And I write in it, and then I fucking get a lighter, and I go outside and I burn it. That's it, magic. Yeah, just because I know nobody's gonna see it. I know I'm not gonna see it ever again, and just to get it out, you know? And there's something therapeutic about it um, in the journaling. I mean, that, that's been a game changer for me. That What you just, what you just told me is pretty much witchcraft. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm from Louisiana, you know. Well, There's I mean, voodoo down there. Well, you know, because when you're writing something, you're spelling. You're spelling. Uh -huh. You know, you're casting spells. You're, uh, you're, cre you're giving something existence through yeah, words. Right. And so, like, that's the thing that, you're, that you should do a lot, like, on full moons and such, is you mm. write down all the things that you want to get to do better, and then you burn it. And then it's like a, it's like a whole thing, or and then also just like writing stuff down that you aren't very happy about, or something that you want to change about you, the way you are, or you know, I wish I was more gentle and stuff like that, and and just like writing Affirmations. down. Yeah, and then when you burn it, it's almost like it's like a conclusion. It's like an ending kind of to it. It's like I want this to be better, and this is what I want to do to do it, and then you burn it, and it like becomes like. It's another element added to it. Goes into the universe. Yeah, it goes into the universe. And then the universe does its mystical powers on it. Yeah, it's like, help me, <laughs> please. <laughs> yeah, it's like, it goes back to like, where we place our attention is where we place our energy. It's true. Know? And for me, it's like this constant search. I wish I, I wish I could be complacent at times. I wish I could just be like, I'm good. But it's like nonstop. I can't. I can't stop it. You know, like this. Just the the search, search for meaning, um, and just the the search of the journey. You know. Yeah. Have you tried meditating? I do meditate. It's the tough. It's one of those toughest things. <laughs> People say that. Well, so okay. So why do you say that? It's because, like you said, our mind is are constantly just. But do you judge it, and you're like. Cause that's what I did when I first started. I'm like, man, I'm not good at this. I can't do it. I can't even sit here for five minutes. It's just like singing. I'm not good at this. Uh, and you said, I yeah. keep doing it. <laughs> yeah. And so I did, I started with an app called Headspace. Yeah. And it's a guided meditation and, 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 and essentially, and I've mentioned this on the show before, like the goal of meditation is not to become the best meditator. It's to just get quiet, get your mind still and let the thoughts come and recognize them. You know, like when we can recognize them and then dismiss them throughout our day, those thoughts are still coming, but it, we're able to slow our mind down. We're able to um, react. I guess that's the best way to say mm -hmm. it. It changes how we react to things versus overreacting. You know, like I read a lot of Stoic philosophy and Stoicism 101 is control what you can control. Let everything else go, right? As hard as that may be to do. I think it's hard for people. I mean, I'm definitely one of them. Controlling, like having control, worst backseat driver ever, right here. I'm gonna admit it. 
um, because you're not in control, you know? Yeah. Like, you see something happening and someone's coming in your lane and you're like, Ugh! and then you're just like screaming and they're like, you're just freaking me off worse. Yeah. You know? <laughs> that's such a great analogy, though, like for what happens in everyday life. We do mm -hmm. overreact for shit that's really not that big of a deal. Yeah, that's true. You know? That's why I think morning routines are, are so important, like to get my mind right for the rest of the day. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, I'll segue into what is your routine? Like what what is Sierra Farrell, a day in the life, what does that look like? Well, it depends because uh, sometimes I wake up really early. Like recently I've been waking up in the middle of the night and just like eating food and then going back to sleep. Like last night I woke up and I ate like a slice of pizza and then I like walked around the house for, for some reason and then went back to and like laid back down and went to sleep. I have like really, I have really weird, I do really weird things. I have like really crazy dreams too. I have like night terrors and which they come and go, you know, like sometimes they're, I won't have a crazy night terror for a long time. And then it's like, oh no, yeah, this happens. I forget. This is the thing that happens in my life. Yeah. I, you know, I just, I'm just getting pulled off the bed. No big deal. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's just fine. You know, but, um. These days, I've been kind of sleeping in a little bit. I wake up early, eat a snack, go back to sleep. Yeah. <laughs> then um, I wake up and I try to get some caffeine in me. I usually try to stay away from nicotine, but every once in a while, you know, I'll be like, okay, I want to mm. dip my feet in, have a cigarette. Um, Are you leaning on some of that, like, for writing? Do you have, like, a, I just picture, like, that romanticized, like, ashtray, cigarette, Coffee, oh, wine. Yeah. Absolutely. You know, you, you definitely need some vices to write a song. Yeah. And I like writing sad songs, so you definitely try to, I try to incorporate as many vices as possible without, you know, killing myself. <laughs> 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 Which I feel like, you know, as we get older, we realize what to do and what not to do as much, so. You kind of fine tune the vices. Yeah, you got to fine tune you the vices. You get efficient with them. You gotta, yeah. 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 I think I would be remiss, like I, I, we talked about your uniqueness and that confidence. I've got to bring up, like you've got to commit to a face, a face tattoo. How did that come about, and how did like you're like this is the one, like this is what I'm doing? Well, honestly, it's kind of an acceptance thing, and like the group of people that you feel are the birds of a feather for you. Just like you know, like a lot of different people, a lot of your friends or your groups, they all look the same. They all have like, or similar things like, and like, just like styles of music, they all have like different styles of clothing that they wear. Mm -hmm. It's like, it's just like a group of people. And like my group of people were travelers and you know, and I'll, it's like, this is like a normal thing that people have. They have face tattoos. Mm -hmm. And it's just like, it's not a big deal from like, from my point of view, because everyone has them. Yeah. And just like, you know, it's like a cowboy hat thing too. Like a lot of um, cowboys love to wear cowboy hats and like they all wear cowboy hats. Yeah. And, uh, and that's just kind of how I got mine. <laughs> so what does it mean? Uh, it's just, it doesn't really mean anything. It's my friend drew it on my face and there's seven areas, which I always say the seven seas. <laughs> Cause it's just like a joke. And then there's also the seven deadly sins. The set, the number seven actually comes up a lot in the Bible. Mm hmm. Um, there's seven days a week. It's like, I don't know, you can take it and... I sometimes used to just make up crazy stories and just... Fair enough, Just yeah. go with it. It's like, this is how many children I have. <laughs> All different dads, you know? <laughs> or just like, it's nothing ridiculous because... Yeah. <laughs> what I do hate, though, is when someone sees my face tattoo and they think it's okay to touch me. Oh, they want to... They'll be like, oh, your face tattoo? And I'm just like... No, 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 no. I <laughs> so I'm not, I just like I just just want to throw that out there to anyone who's listening to this. If you see a girl with a tattoo, please don't think it's okay to touch it <laughs> yeah. and ask about it. Just ask about it. Just don't just don't touch it. Well, it's definitely it's it's a it's you pull it off like you rock it, you know, and it is who you are. Um, how do you? Where you're at now, where you're in Nashville, you're doing your thing, you're killing it. How do you overcome like expectations, whether that be from yourself or from other people, like whenever you're writing music? Like, how do you stay true to what is true to Sierra, 
and not fall victim of expectations. That's a tough call because, um, especially expectations of people who we put up on a pedestal, who the expectations of someone whose opinion matters, you know? Mm -hmm. Because, you know, people can say stuff that matters to them all the time and you're like, whatever. Because they don't, they don't have as much value in your heart or in mm -hmm. your mind. And you just like brush it off. But whenever it comes to expectations of people that you value and hold up on a pedestal, like I said, it's really hard. Um, but at the end of the day, it's your body, it's your voice, and um, your mind in a way, you know, because it's like you, your mind creates your reality. Mm -hmm. And so I guess it's just try not to hold that up too high. Just, you know, do the right thing that's what is morally right, and also just do the right thing that... Like a know your intentions kind of deal. Yeah, like, yeah, and it's... I just know your intentions. And like I said, when you're writing a song, delivery is everything. Just like if you can sell a song, if you can sell a shirt, you might be able to sell a song. I don't know. What does that mean? Like make people believe it? Yeah. Yeah, make people believe it. Regardless if you've went through that pain, like make people believe it. Yeah. Who comes up with your costumes? Oh, I just, I just like to wear lots of it's random. It's so fun. Thank you. Right? I just get bored. I'm like, you know what? I want to be a goth cowgirl today. <laughs> and it's just like, sometimes it's just funny to like throw people off too. Cause it's like, okay, I could go to honky tonk Tuesday and wear a cowboy hat and a spinny skirt. Or I could go to honky tonk Tuesday in like this crazy goth outfit. Cause it's people are just like, what the heck? Cause it just throws people off. It gives people, it keeps people on their toes. Yeah. Cause it's like some, you know, People get so caught up in the way, like, images and, like, you know, purists. Or, what it's supposed to be. Yeah, what it's supposed to be, purists. Yeah. Um, I think but, that's why so many people resonate with you, right? Like, why your fans are so good, like, because they kind of want that in a way. They want to be unique. They admire somebody who can do that, right? Yeah, I mean, I definitely look up to a lot of artists who um kind of have like a wacky sort of sense you know yeah Billie Eilish is like killing it these days like with her style and yeah I love that <laughs> and I think yeah like I was guilty of it for a long time like the social conditioning the 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 environment that we were that I grew up in like this is success do this 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 look this way and don't get outside the lines well it's what we're groomed for yeah as especially like being born in America you, they have such these expectations of what, especially women. I mean, men have it hard, but in a man's world, unfortunately, right now. But uh, there's just so expect so many expectations for women to be like hairless or like, you know, to be to be blonde or to be brunette or just just in the magazines and. They even admit it too. Like it's like, oh, we Photoshop these pictures. Mm -hmm. They even admit it, but it still just creates this wall in our, in, in our minds that you're not good enough, or you're mm -hmm. you need to go get plastic surgery to look away, or get breast implants, or you know, if you want to do if you want to do good for yourself, work out, eat healthy. Yeah, just. Try not to be hard on yourself because everyone else is going to be hard on you. So just love yourself. Right? Yeah, the self-judgment thing. The self-judgment thing is, is detrimental in so many ways. And uh, the fears, the worries. I, I don't know. Like, So I know the fears and the worries. And like you mentioned earlier, the negative like chatter by default. Like that's evolutionary. Like we had to do that to survive. We had to have fears and worries. If there's a lion around this corner, if we eat this berry, I've said this before on the show, like if we eat this berry, are we gonna die? Like, so that makes sense to me. Anytime I have a, like get really curious about something, you know, like that, it, it goes back to like evolution. Like that's how we survive for so long, but we don't need that anymore, really. So we're like rewiring this hardwire that has allowed us to survive for so long. Yeah. You know? And we're not made to be in touch with a million people. <laughs> like we're made to be in touch with what's around us, what we actually so really true. touch. Yeah. And you know, it's 
it's a step forward in our mental growth of trying to comprehend that that's our reality now. And just like you said, hardwiring yeah. it to where to, to understand that. Mm -hmm. So true. I never thought about it like that, but yeah, there wasn't Instagram back in the gap. Yeah, there wasn't Instagram. <laughs> so I'll roll into this, 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 um, this segment is brought to you by Ghostwood Distilling Company. And so we'll lighten it up a little bit. We'll lighten it up a little bit. Um, if you could go back in time to any time period, any time for one week, when would that be and why? That's a loaded potato because I feel like at different points in my life, there's been different eras that I've romanticized about or loved. I would, but the other thing too about it is they didn't have the science as as like we do now compared to then. Um, and you know, movies also romanticize about mm -hmm. all these things. Like the Victorian era is looks pretty awesome. I love it. Everyone didn't look like that. You know what I'm saying? Like everyone didn't look like that. And like <laughs> men pro wore wigs and women wore wigs because lice was just rampant everywhere. And they wore wigs so then they didn't have to deal with the lice and they would go in their, in their wigs and they would like get rid of them or whatever. And, but um, it is fun to romanticize and think about stuff like that. Mm -hmm. So I would probably say, because I love the 20s, because I love the 20s music. Mm -hmm. I love the 40s, same, and the style. Um, Victorian era, that was like one of my favorites. That's where you'd go. I would love, yeah. Even though, you know, I'd probably just be you know, some peasant girl. What well, if you could like go back in that time and then like bring your phone with you and post like to your Instagram and like share what's going on back then now? It's kind of a trippy question. I feel like they, it's almost, it would almost be like interacting in, with an alien. Right, yeah. I feel like aliens are hiding from us because we're not ready. You know what I'm saying? I was yeah. like, all oh, these, God, God, come on guys, you're almost there. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> it's just like, they're looking at us like we look at monkeys, maybe. Yeah, exactly. They're just if, like, if what? Even that this? far. Yeah. They're like, they're destroying the earth? What the heck? What's wrong with these yeah. What's wrong with this? Redo. Let's just blow up the earth. Redo. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah. Okay. Got another one for you. No matter what anybody says to the answer to this, it makes me laugh. So you're in a public restroom and somebody knocks on the door. What is your response? Somebody's in here. You go with somebody's in here. Somebody's in here. <laughs> <laughs> I go silent. Like, I don't say anything. You go silent? <laughs> I just go silent. It's like the door's locked. You'll figure it out. <laughs> yeah. I just go silent, and then, and then I hear the next person walk up, and, and then they start talking shit about, like, no, That's my pun, favorite. no pun intended. <laughs> but, yeah. <laughs> All right, we know somebody's in there, you know, and, and then I got to come out and do the walk of shame, and... Or like whenever <laughs> you walk by them and then like they're just talking about, I don't know if they've been in there for a long and you like open the door and you're like, oh, hey, <laughs> fancy seeing you here. <laughs> Catch them in the middle of talking about you. Um, best investment in the last six months under $100. Well, probably my best investment that I've always really and really, really, really enjoyed is clothes because that's just, that's like my happy place. Mm -hmm. And it, all my closest friends and uh, people know that. They're like, well, Sierra's having a bad day. Let's take her shopping. <laughs> 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 and you know, I'm not expensive either. Like, I mean, I could go to some expensive places, but I like to go to Goodwill. And I was gonna say this shirt came, this came from a vintage store, but yes, I'm with you, Goodwill. I need you to be honest on this one. What okay. was the last thing you Googled? The last thing I Googled. <laughs> For some reason, I thought of this show where, was, where this guy's talking about he's like Googling midgets or something, midgets wrestling. And I just don't know why. I just like imagine that. See, this is where we were talking about with the mind. Where, where, why does the mind go there? It goes all over the place. It goes all over the place. So what, you YouTube midget wrestling? I'm... <laughs> I did not, but that's for some reason it made me think of that. I love wrestling. I used to watch wrestling all the time. DDP. 
DDP, yeah. Tommy Dallas Page, people's elbow. Yeah. I still do that to people sometimes. <laughs> <laughs> My favorite, I think, I had to be like the junkyard dog. The wrestler? Yeah, the junkyard dog, the wrestler. I liked Mankind a lot. Mankind, yeah. He hung around for a minute. Yeah. He was around for a long time. And then he like wore that crazy face paint. And then, but then it was like NWO or something, because it was like WCW, then NWO, and then it was WWF. Or something. Yeah. yeah. I don't know why I know and this. Then MMA, <laughs> and then MMA took over. And then MMA took over. Yeah. Nobody wants to see fake. Yeah. <laughs> <It's> like, <laughs> they like hit the. Anyways. You got the foot. Like the timing is good. Dude, I I used to watch it so much. Did you ever go to any of them live? No, I've always watched. I mean, I pay pay per view. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. So um, the last thing I googled was probably honestly where I can get COVID testing. Twenty twenty one, woo! <laughs> <laughs> yeah, fun times. <laughs> Crazy stuff, man. Okay, book that you have either reread the most or that you gift to other people the most? You know, I'm not a big reader. No? I know, it sounds terrible, and that's probably why my songs are so simple. It's because I, and that's the thing, y'all. If you want to write songs, I hear reading books is really good. Because it's like, it gives you like, it gives, you know, it gives you more knowledge and like you have more words in the dictionary up mm -hmm. there and you've got in your dictionary. <laughs> <laughs> but, um, uh, I used to read comic books a lot. Really? Yeah, I was always into Marvel comic books. And I used to watch, I used to also read a lot of manga stuff, which is anime yeah. book. Um, I did read, um, what's that one book? It's called One, Kurt Vonnegut. One, never read Yeah, it. Kurt Vonnegut. I've like read some of his books. It was really awesome. And recently, uh, you know what? I'm gonna take it back. I probably read for the longest time the other day on a plane. It was like, it was a plane to Seattle. So it was like, it took a while to get there. And I, I've been reading like this, this book about um, mountain, like mountain tales, river tales and stuff mm -hmm. about people who live like back in the hollers and the right. Appalachian. And that's really cool. And I've, uh, been buying books around town about ghost stories about Nashville. Oh, right on. I like I like stuff like that. I like watching scary movies and stuff and ghost stories. And any influence going to be? Have you have you pulled any influence yet that is going to be in a song? I feel like maybe. I hope so. Yeah. Maybe if not today or tomorrow, maybe years down the line. Maybe That's even the subconsciously, like yeah, it's in there. Exactly. Yeah. It's just it's like it's amazing how we can turn around things that we pick up, you know, from other people and just experiences and yeah. 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 And we don't realize it until it's too late. <laughs> exactly. Um what's this this may be this may be personal. If you don't want to answer it, you don't have to. Screensaver, what is the screensaver on your phone? The screensaver uh on the back like when you go in my phone, it's a stone to moon. Stone to moon. It's a moon that's like this. And he's smiling. And then probably on the the cover that's on my on mine is it's a picture of me that I wanted to actually be my album cover. And so I was like, Well, if it's not gonna be my album cover, it's gonna be the the front of my phone. <laughs> and I've just been through so many phones, y'all, that I'm so desensitized with like putting pictures in with people and like actually it took me forever to even put a picture up there because mm. it was just the way it was and I'm like this is just the way it is now and then you know when you're sitting around having to wait around and you're playing on your phone and then you decide to just finally do something like that mm -hmm. <laughs> mine's still the original way just whatever it comes with the yeah stock. see I'm saying I did that for so long that's kind of what this shirt reminds me of <laughs> It's like it's, it's like the backdrop of like the original. Yeah. <laughs> <That's funny>. <laughs> <laughs> um, 
Are you a safe for a rainy day or spend it while you got it kind of person? Spend it while you got it kind of person. Ooh, yeah. Lord. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> bad at spending. Clothes, I assume. Clothes and just random things for other people, random things for myself. What about guitars? You are, know, you a, are you a collector? I I do have a, quite a handful of guitars. I have like, uh, I love Gretsch. Uh, what's well, Gretsch, but it's spelled Gretsch. Mm. <laughs> I don't know if y'all looked at that, but you should. It's hilarious. <laughs> She's like, where are they? Where's the enunciation in this? What's happening? Um, Is that your go-to, like your favorite? I love Gretsch's and I, you know, I love J45s. I love J45s a lot, especially jumbo bodies. Really? And from where I'm such a smaller person, I just, I love bigger guitars. Mm. Cause it makes me look even smaller. <laughs> so, um, and you know, I've been playing Blue Ridges a, for a while now. And I recently just got gifted a guitar from Thompson and it's this company in uh, Sisters, Oregon. Is that what Billy Strings plays? That's exactly, exactly. That's what Billy Strings plays. And also my good friend, Lindsay Liu, and, and a handful of other artists, like, you know, Molly Tuttle, she right plays, on. she plays them. And uh, they're willing to cut me a deal to get, to design my guitar. And I kind of want to get one with my, be one of those people and get my name on the headstock and maybe like a cool little inlay. Good for that you, I yeah, hell yeah. That's awesome. Um, we'll go back in time. Favorite cartoon as a kid? Uh, Tom and Jerry. I'm with you, Tom and Jerry. It's like forever comedic relief. <laughs> yeah, Tom and Jerry. Tom and Jerry and the Andy Griffith, it's not a cartoon, but the Andy Griffith show, those two. Yeah. Da -da 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 -da. I can't whistle, can you whistle? Yeah. Are you good at it? Um, okay, I'm like an average whistler. An average? Average, yeah. <laughs> Prove it. Yeah, I'm not doing it. No, I'm not, I'm not doing it. Um, <laughs> song you wish you wrote. Song I wish I wrote? Okay, so here's one of my guilty pleasures. I'm like, I love Hosier. I don't know if you guys listen to him. Or, but, well, there's like a few of his songs that I hear that I'm just like, oh my gosh, this is so good. I wish I wrote this song. But, but at the end of the day, I didn't write the song. But um, I definitely want to go for more of an older sound, I feel like, even, even more on my next record. So. Really? Cross, yes. Are you already writing for that one? Yes. Are you putting stuff together? Mm -hmm. I'm already ready to go in the studio and start like tomorrow, but you know, uh, you know how it is working with industry people. It's like you have to wait your turn. I don't know, but I'm finding out. You have to wait your turn, especially like from where it's like, I'm in rounder. And so like, you know, you got to wait your turn in the studio because it's like, they're working, they're building up everyone in a way. Like it's like, uh. you know, cause it, my record's coming out, so I have something to already look for, kind of forward to, to do mm -hmm. tour that, and even though I would like to get started already, because I'm just, I get antsy. I, I saw a quote the other day. Maybe, I think I made this one up. It says, uh, I don't have time to be patient. Maybe I made this one up. I don't have up. time to be patient. <laughs> yeah. That's a good one, though. Yeah. All right, um, last question, and, and then I'll, we'll get you to play one out. If you could have a billboard, Sierra, to get a, um, I don't know if I said her name with an R, but <laughs> if you could have a billboard, Sierra, to get a message out to millions of people, hypothetically speaking, what does the message say? Always ask questions. I love it. Always ask questions, because are you just going to sit there and believe what everyone's telling you? Just, I mean, I could go on with other things, but I'm just, I'm gonna save that for another time. But it's just, nobody really even knows. Even like, people be like, well, there's science behind it. And it's just like, I don't know. Do you believe in aliens? <laughs> like, do you believe in aliens? There's something out there, yeah. And I love that, I love that too, by the way, because I question everything almost to a fault. Like, almost like conspiracy theorists, like, we don't know anything really. Yeah. Like sure there's laws of the universe, but we really don't know anything. Well, for the UFOs incident, it's like, they're like, well, that breaks the laws of physics. Well, maybe the laws of physics aren't right. You know what I'm saying? 
Well, it wasn't that long ago we thought the world was flat, right? Yeah, well, that's true. And there's still some flat earthers out there. But like, <laughs> Bless their heart. <laughs> yeah. But that's, th- who was it? Mark Twain that says, all I know is that I know nothing. And so that's kind of what I live by, and it keeps me hyper curious and asking questions. Yeah. Yeah, I love that. So what do you think? You want to play one out? Yeah. Wanna wrap it? Let's wrap it up. Sweet. Like a little present. Sweet, sweet. <laughs> Uh, I'm going to play the tune, I Do It Again, and it's the tune that I wrote with my buddy, uh, Nate Leith, and his partner, Audrey McAlpine. And like I said before, this is the tune that it was the mic, it was kind of uh, Michelangelo's fault. Thanks, Michelangelo. And I'm not talking about the Mutant Ninja Turtle either. I'm talking about the favorite. artist. He was my favorite. <laughs> I know, right? <laughs> um, so here's I Do It Again. I wish I was a tree Big old branches and big old leaves You can come down and sit right under Or climb me if you're feeling fun I wish I was a creek You know the one that's winding The one that's deep You just come down and skip your rocks but baby, won't you drink me up? But now, pretty soon, you know the pain is gonna come on strong all night long. But I do it, yes I do it, you know I do it again. I wish I was your shoes when you're out there dancing, you're cutting loose. I just let you walk all over me, but I kiss your feet every day. I wish I was your rocking chair, you know, the one that's old and the one that's square. Oh, rock your pen away, but now, baby, take a sit on me. But now, pretty soon, you know the pain is gonna come on strong. And I mean all night long, but I do it. Yes, I do it, you know I do. I didn't want it to end. <laughs> I'd do it again. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. It's beautiful. Thank you. Beautiful. So my, uh, the question I forgot to ask during the interview is, how do you continue to improve? Like, How do you continue to improve guitar? How do you continue to improve your voice, writing? 
Um, the thing is to not let it rest too long because, uh, I know it ain't like fiddle though. I've been trying to play fiddle and like you can practice that thing for months. And if you set, if you walk away from that instrument for more than a freaking week, it's like you're relearning it all over again. Really? It's insane. <laughs> that's like, that's like something you gotta learn, like, learn young, but you know, everyone's different and you know. So, so consistency. It's the consistency. Just like, you know. I might not even be working on my own music, but I'm singing something. Mm -hmm. I'm singing someone else's song, or singing with people, or yeah. singing on the, singing to songs on the radio. Um, ain't no rest. Ain't no rest over here. <laughs> whenever you're trying to play music. I love it. So you got the the new album coming out. Tell folks um, where they can hear more from you and your your tunes. Yeah, um, I got the record, you know, um, as you said, it's coming out August 20th. Um, and I've got two gigs at the basement. They're all sold out, though, unfortunately. But I do have a vinyl signing on the 21st at the Groove um, from noon to, I'm not sure how long it goes on to, but um, I'm sure maybe just at least a few hours. Yeah. And um, you can get your limited edition sort of, situation because it's the only ones that's going out to the vinyl shops which is the olive green collar right on and uh i just realized when this airs it's going to be past the 20. no it won't it'll be on the 21st so they'll have when it comes out at nine they've got an hour okay got, oh, so you yeah. folks have an hour <laughs> well what's some other thing like but website, so you're yeah thing? let let folks know website instagram yeah. all that good stuff uh yeah i've got a website sierrafarrellmusic.com uh I've got a bunch of merch on there. I've got candle bundles for people who like to. Even face oh. tats. I saw that. Oh yeah, yeah. that's a, I love I love it whenever um, adult well adults get them, but I love it when kids get them and put them on their face. <laughs> I, I know this one guy who got one. Sorry, excuse me. I have the hiccups. I, I saw this one guy put it on his guitar. <laughs> I thought yeah. that was so cute. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I said face tat. I guess you could really you could put it anywhere you wanted. Yeah. But. Um. I don't know, life is wild. It's so long for the ride. That's it, man. <laughs> well, I appreciate you coming in today. I yeah, really, thanks for I, having I, me. You're the real deal. And, um, you know, if you guys have not heard of Sierra Farrell, Farrell please go check her, check her music out. Um, I haven't seen a live show. I, I want to. Um, we're going to be in Nashville this week. Um, but you just said it sold out. So maybe another time. But I, I definitely, I'm a fan. So yeah, I, I well. appreciate your time on the show today. I hope we get to um, actually hang out and uh, have some time to drink and listen we're, to music and play music together. <laughs> yeah, we, I can definitely make time for that, I promise okay. you. <laughs> right on. <laughs>